Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. This week, episode 23, on Open Seas. End of show. The Grey Room. Of the Grey House. Of the Grey Continent. Of the Grey Dream. Jennifer Dash hadn't had a restful night's sleep since joining the Orion. Weeks of tumultuous, undulating grey walls were wrecking havoc on Jen's disposition. Most nights, viewing her surroundings from a forced, third-person perspective, staring down at herself from somewhere above, Jen hid from her own dream state. She'd managed, on nearly a nightly basis, to crawl underneath her bed in the dream. There, underneath the great weight of the levitating mattress, she'd cover her ears, trying not to speculate on how she could still somehow watch herself from up above, even though she'd hid away under the bed. The reason for hiding, of course, was what lay just beyond the menacing walls which shook, wilted, and seemed to breathe with every passing moment. The cat-themed man. A furry body with shrill, high ears, a tail, whiskers, and the unmistakable mug of Thomas Flusher O'Malley. He beckoned her. Flusher beckoned the sleeping Jen to come through the gray walls, to push through to where the dead sleep. This beckoning, more than just audio, played out in the room like a sound wave ripple through the air. It was a cat call, yes, but in the perversity's meowing, a hidden voice whispered, Come, Jen. Come to us. See how it really is. For this reason, night after night, unwanted visit after unwanted visit to that dream house, Jen plugged her ears and hid herself away under the bed. But dreams don't work the way waking life does. One's efforts to avoid conflict, to suppress fear, only elicits further confrontation. There's no denying the dream witch, her curse. Deep in her mind, Jen surmised on this night, during this particular dream, that maybe the only way to end the torment, to end the hell of repetition, was to wade into its depths. Flusher the cat couldn't really hurt her here, right? He couldn't reap his vengeance for real. Could he? Not in this life. And so, it was only prudent, it was only reasonable, to answer his howling siren song. To face the music and push through the gray. Tonight. Right here. Right in this moment. Right now. Jen reached through the undulating grayness. There was nothing exactly to feel, pushing her hand into the wall like it was liquid mercury. No, no feeling. There was taste. In the way that only makes sense in dreams, Jen tasted the wall, tasted the gray, tasted it all, in her hand and in her arm. And the taste was of blood, metallic gray blood. The taste oozed its way up her arm as if eating her from the inside out. Now, inside the wall. Inside the wall. This. This was inside the wall. If Jen had ever seen The Lord of the Rings, she'd be reminded of the way Frodo's world looked when he put the Ring of Power on. A blurred realm of misshapen forms. But she hadn't seen those films, and so Jen's shock and fear exploded. Of course, all of this was Jen's own doing. This dream didn't come from outside. This was Jen on fire in her own mind. This was her own working out. So while there was fear, there was also a certain anticipation. She wondered where the Flusher cat went, and as soon as she asked it, she arrived at an answer. Flusher was leading her. He was just ahead of her, a blurry vision of the near future. And as she came to this conclusion, she spotted his silhouette. The interior of the inside wall world was not one of focus, but... 
As Jen focused her attention on following the White Rabbit, a.k.a. Cartoon Catman, she watched her feet step down a spiral wooden staircase. There weren't more than one or two steps in full view at a time, but each step brought another. Down and down, Jennifer Dash twirled. Down and down, she followed the hideous poltergeist. Down and down. Until an end. No more steps. Jen looked up from the ground, noticing now that below her toes lay not another spiraling wooden step, but a white marble floor, to take in an entire wide room of white marble. In the corner, Flusher pointed. He pointed towards the middle of the room. He pointed to nothing. No, not nothing, Jen's mind concluded. There is not nothing there. There's my fear. There's my roommate. There's my Tiff. Tiff, Jen's slain roommate from Magical Kingdom, a long-standing member of the underground homeless circuit known as the Patriots, sat, arms outstretched, her eyes peeled on Jen. Hello, Jen. Jen wouldn't respond. She couldn't speak. She had nothing to say. Nothing to say? Tiff smiled wickedly. Tiff's right arm was hooked up to a bag of blood. Her left, just as Jen's once did, lay sliced open, spilling into a pool of blood. Jen stared at the pool. The blood was so dark. Far closer to black than any sort of red. Aren't you going to say thank you? Tiff said. Jen didn't respond. Instead, she took her eyes off the pool of blood, off the slashed wrist of Tiff, onto the baggie of blood. It, too, was something less than red. Not black, but yellow. Yellowish green. It isn't exactly a fair trade now, is it? Tiff said. You got my blood, now I get yours. But I gave you the best of me, my pure heart's blood. That's what you got. As Jen tried to comprehend Tiff's words, she looked at Tiff's head, trying to see if the head wound she endured was visible. Maybe the injury had healed. Maybe Tiff was okay. Maybe she never actually killed her. Maybe Tiff never died. The funny thing is, now you carry me with you everywhere you go. It'll be my blood in your eyeballs that first beholds Great Leviathan. It'll be my blood in your heart that finally solves the world. In a way, you're more me than you. You've been drained and filled up with all of me. Kind of romantic in a way, isn't it? The wolves caved in on Jen, her heart racing. Cat Flusher O'Malley appears in front of her face, nary an inch away from Jen's lips. He says, Jen for free dash, will you marry me? The cat man moves in to kiss Jen. Why are we dead, Jen? Eyes open. Out of bed. It's the middle of the night on the Orion. Jen, fear and loathing coursing through her veins, decides it's best to get some fresh air, to come check on Lizard as she steers the schooner whilst the others slept. Jen hoped seeing another real person would snap her back to reality. Every night had gone by like this. Jen awaking from some grotesque dream, then making her way in Long John's out to talk to the lizard at the helm and look out over the deep black of the Pacific's unending night horizon. In the end, she'd chosen South America, and mostly had felt good about that decision. Jen didn't like that the crew rested its fate on her decision, a decision between two places she'd never been. How was a 17-year-old supposed to make a decision like that? She'd never been on a boat before, let alone been to South America, or Africa for that matter. Was Mecca even in Africa? Jen wasn't altogether sure. At any rate, the crew of the Orion accepted Jen's decision with relative ease. There was some snickerings of how, of course, Miles Fa, the resident mental magician, got his way. But overall, no dissenter appeared outwardly to treat Jen worse for her conclusion. That was weeks ago, and now, just days out from shouting, Land Ho! and making inland for the eponymous quiet room, Jen felt at ease on the ship, except of course for the dreams, and the exhaustion derived therein from the nightmaric nightly tradition. On this night, as Jen arose and walked through the galley, then on the deck, she found that there was a course of activity aboard the ship. And yet, each little unit was ignorant of the others, fully convinced that they were alone under the cover of dark night. First, Jen passed the bathroom. The door was closed, but light streamed from under the door. The ship's bathroom was a tiny little thing, and being the only bastion of internal relief, there was often a line for its usage. Jen had assumed she'd have a free pass to its services at this late hour, 
and so she cringed at her unfortunate finding that said lavatory was occupied. Jen supposed she could wait until after her rendezvous with Lizard to pee, but as she passed the door, the strange sounds coming from the small room caused for pause. <coughs> The grunts were unmistakably those of Jorge Robles, the ship's eccentric, <clears throat> extremist pagan. Self-flagellation. Robles was whipping himself. <clears throat> Why? He was no self-loathing monk. Surely he didn't view himself as a reprobate that required penance through suffering. So why do this? Why torment thyself in the middle of the night? Under his moans, his aches, Jen heard the Mexican mutter, Thy will be done. Thy will is hard. Thy will be done. Thy will is perfect. Thy will. Thy will. This odd event would have rumbled through Jen's mind until she came up with some internal rationalization for Robles' strange behavior, had she not then been overwhelmed by another sight. On the kitchen table, on full display for any passerby, as Jen so happened to be on this evening, Merkel and the first mate of the Orion hunched themselves over the body of a small monkey. There was no denying the sight. There it was, as plain as day, a midnight autopsy. Both doctors wore masks over their faces as they cut out this poor simian's brains. The two were in such ecstasies of concentration that neither noticed Jennifer as she tiptoed right on by and climbed the stairs up onto the deck. The ocean air in her hair and on her face did Jen some good. The ocean was real, the waves confident and consistent. These realities had concreted themselves as forces of good for Jen. Sure, every day for the first six days on board brought with it vomitous bouts of seasickness, but that was a small price to pay for a fine reality, a pulsing, thick reality, not like the dreams beyond the gray walls. Those were manic, ever undulating, and brimful of guilt married with deception. The ocean blew away such illusions and made visions of monkey autopsies lose their luster. Thankfully, Jen made her way to the helm. Lizard, faithful woman she was, peered ahead as she kept her hands on the wheel. Good evening, Miss Free. Good evening, Lizard. Any Blakeian visions tonight? Not yet. Lizard had so obsessively talked of William Blake that Jen had begun to address this with a new assortment of vocabulary terms. A thought of inspiration was a Blakeian vision. A new plan or idea was a, quote, compass path, while new experiences that one couldn't understand were to be labeled as songs of innocence. That left experiences in which one could gain insight as songs of experience. To this end, Lizard currently spoke. I had a song of experience today. Oh yeah? How's that? I passed Sir Isaac's room while off talk to him. The captain wasn't angry at all. Really? And you understand this? He asked Isaac why Isaac wanted to go to Mecca. Isaac's answered that question a hundred times already. He gave a different answer this time. Really? Isaac has a secret agenda? I don't think so. But he said that the stars point him there. Like how? Is that a metaphor or something? No. Sir Isaac's an astrologist. What? No. Isaac's a man of mathematics. Why would he be into that type of voodoo? These two... Mathematics and astrology are not divorced in the way you might imagine they are. So you know what he was talking about. You know what the stars are saying. No, but Alfred seemed to understand. So what's your conclusion? What insight did you gain? I'm left with more questions than answers. Still sounds like a song of innocence to me. I believe Isaac and Captain Elf are not so against each other as they appear. You think they're faking it? You think they're just putting on a show acting like they hate each other all the time? I think so, yes. 
Had Jen had more faith and trust in Liz, she would have opined about the monkey autopsy she just witnessed. But as things were, Jen still was yet to feel particularly chummy around the elephantitis victim. Years ago, Jen had caught a documentary on TV about a one Mr. Joseph Merrick, the man well known in history for being given the circus title, The Elephant Man. He died a sad life, but Jen recalled that the man had a sweet disposition, and one short poem Merrick often quoted stuck with her. The poem read, "'Tis true my form is something odd, but blaming me is blaming God. Could I create myself anew, I would not fail in pleasing you." But Elizabeth, a.k.a. Lizard, was not like Mr. Merrick. She talked with such consistent fervor for a future. A future or a vision, a vision or a destiny, a destiny or God knows what, Jen could never quite grasp Elizabeth Schumacher's M.O., and because of this, Lizard remained, day in, day out, an obscure figure for Jennifer. She felt that at any given moment, Lizard would sell Jen off to the highest bidder if it offered Lizard a glimpse at the divine. Therefore, it was best not to speak of Midnight Monkey postmortems. The next day was difficult. It was not so because work on the bow of the ship required an unusual feat for Jennifer. It was merely the addition of yet another day without sufficient sleep. You see, in those days there were many continual tasks and trivial aspects of life aboard the Orion that surely would be well worth the mention. They would create a kaleidoscope to better view Jen through. It would embiggen your view of her seafaring world. But those days riding on top of the waves of the sea are behind us now. For sanity's sake, and of course for the sake of our ever-dissolving memories, we must forsake the mundane details of the life aquatic and stick to the narrative. One event that day, however, is worth mentioning. The return of Gimli the Goal. The foul bore in its beak the contents of many pieces of mail, of course. And, very perceptively, Jen thought, yesterday's newspaper from Cajamarca, Peru. Jen giggled at how Gimli fawned over Merkel's petting and soft words to the bird. It was the sweetest Jen had ever seen this rough-necked Merkel behave. This act of gentle regard to the male bird nearly erasing the sullen image of Merkel the monkey brain excavator. What do we got? Lex called out. Merkel tenderly grabbed the mailbag from out of Gimli's mouth. Let's see. Gadar, looks like something from your father. Sir Isaac's got some sort of certificate from the University of Columbia. One for me, one for Miles, and... One for Jennifer. Jennifer Dash. Jenny, I guess this one's for you? You from Jennings, Louisiana? Or did Gimli grab the wrong mail? Uh, no, no, that's that's mine. It's, uh, just a, a pet name. Ah, a pet name from Atticus Further, then. Jen ran and grabbed the letter, smothering it to her chest. Atticus remembers her. Atticus still thinks of her. Atticus misses her. Humphaliandra from Atticus. Humphaliandra from Atticus! Jen was a new woman. Who cared for sleep when thoughts of Atticus further were so close? This letter, she could touch it. She could caress it. A bashful thought then overwhelmed Jen. Did she really like Atticus so much? She nearly called out, My love! to herself in the ecstasy of the moment. But she didn't love Atticus. Did she? No. That'd be silly. That'd be like the time Antonio de Anconia said he loved her. Love didn't work that way. Love was a slow bleed a slow transfusion of virtue into the bloodstream. Not stupid Tiff's blood. Not poisoned blood. Not bad blood. This Jennifer, the one called Jennifer Free, she wasn't worthy of a letter from the noble Atticus. The perfect gentleman boy. The darling saint of the Pelican State. He was so far better than Jen. He was perfect and pure. As for Jen, she was used, worn down, jaded. Could she even claim to look at Leviathan with an honest heart anymore? Once upon a time, she wanted to find the mythical beast for reasons of honest curiosity. But now, was Jen able to do anything honestly? Everything had the burden of stain to it. Jen was stained. Stained with the blood of her roommate. Stained like a Dutch prostitute's bald head. Meanwhile, half the crew was breezing through the local Peruvian newspaper. Jen would come to find out later, everyone on board the Orion, save Miles Fa and herself, of course, spoke Spanish fluently. That's what Jen got for climbing aboard a ship of idiot savants. Not the headline, but a sidebar column of the newspaper reported the reappearance of the fabled figure Pishtaco. The report spoke of three people, 
One of them a child who said they spotted a fat, quote, white demon feeding on the carcass of something. Naturally, being of good cheer collectively and having no real concept of the dangers that lie ahead, no member of the Orion that read the article put much stock in the rumor. There's the cat man, here's the blood taste in the arm, now the spiral wooden staircase, one step at a time, the marble room, Tiff, blood in one arm, blood out the other. But wait, look again, there's a change. The blood, the pool, the pool's gone. Gone is the cylindric pond of wrist gore. In its place, in its stead, a green flame burns. The blood falls, drip drop, into a vacuous green flame the same as the one Dolores Burden had danced around. St. Fetus's fire, the flame of Pied Piper, the vengeance of that cruel angel, that child napper. Jenna woke suddenly. Father Thomas was shaking her. I'm sorry, Jennifer. You were moaning in your sleep and... I... I was praying, and I, I thought I... I understood it to be best to awake you. Father, get Miles Fobb for me, would you? Why? I'm sure he's sleeping. Father, if you sin in a dream, do you sin in real life? Why, I... I don't know. Sin is a complicated subject. Would you wake Miles for me? Of course. Father Thomas acted obediently. Miles Fogg came. There was something about being woken up in the middle of that reoccurring horror that leveled a surge of decisiveness in Jennifer Dash. Her blood swelled with instant clarity. She couldn't go on like this. She couldn't live day to day with nightly horrors. She was going to end this. Tonight. Miles, will you hypnotize me? And why would I do that now? I, I can't sleep. There's lots of cures for that. Hypnotism is a bit drastic. Not exactly a first step. May I speak to you alone, Miss Free? I'd, I'd like to talk to you about this hypnotism. It's, it's not a, it's not, it's not at all safe. Look, safety's not the issue, Jen. It's more of a matter of, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. To this, Father Thomas replied, I beg your pardon? I can't escape the past. It just keeps replaying and replaying every time I close my eyes. Ah, I see. Yes, but why not try something else? I'll pray with you through the night if you'd like. I'd be happy to help, Jen. I I just feel... Uh, would you excuse us for a moment, Miles? Why, Tom? No, he doesn't need to leave, said Jen. Yes, but... There's some things I really think you should take into account. You woke me up, Father Thomas. Do you want to know what I was dreaming of? No answer from either man. There's this guy... dressed funny. Old-timey funny, Jen said. Medieval, even. And he's playing a flute, dancing around from tiptoe to tiptoe. And he's dancing around a green flame. It's a pretty flame. It reaches all the way up to the stars. But there's this bar of wood laying horizontally above the green fire, and I'm strapped onto it. I'm just high enough not to burn completely, but I can smell the ends of my hair. I have my old hair in the dream and it's burning black. Jen indeed intended to lie about the contents of her dream, but why this particular lie, this particular vision came to mind, was well beyond her. But now was not the time to question such things. Jen continued. I know for certain that if I don't do anything, if I just leave things be, then I'll end up dead, burned alive by the green. But there's something in the silly flute player's song. It's... It's giving me the answer. It tells me that if I just promise to follow him, the medieval dancer, then I'll be all right. The flame won't overcome me. All I have to do is believe in him, this one random guy. Jen turned her attention now specifically to Father Thomas. I asked about sin because I know in my heart that it's wrong to pledge allegiance to this man. Somehow, 
I know he's evil. It's a sin to follow him. Jen turned her gaze then to Miles. And so I keep my mouth shut every night. And every night I'm lower, closer to being devoured by the flame. One of these nights, I'm going to break down. I'm going to follow the flute player. I'm scared of what that'll mean. I'm scared of what happens after. The methodical crashing of the ocean current against the boat was the only sound heard by the three souls that moment. Jen liked it that way. She was selling her story wholeheartedly, and the two men were eating it up. She'd set the table well enough, now to feast, now to get what she really wanted. Miles, can you replace my dream with something else? Under hypnosis. Yes. Well, theoretically, yeah, yes. I don't see why not. The priest stammered. I, I can't, I can't abide by this. Do what you wish. Good night. Wait. Jen said firmly. Miles, you'll put me under. Father Thomas, I want you to replace my dream. Replace it with something good. Something wholesome. I, I don't understand. Miles said blankly, She doesn't trust me. She doesn't trust what I'll fill the gap with. Slowly, Father Thomas smiled. Smart girl. What shall I say, Jennifer? Just tell a story. A good one. Uh, I don't know any good stories. Tell a Bible story, Miles offered. No, Jen said resolutely. The last Bible story I listened to got me into this big mess. Just tell me a story from your heart. Father Thomas saw in his mind a field of wheat. This image always appeared to him whenever he came to a peaceful answer to his internal questions. He smiled again. I think I've got something. Will you do it, Miles? Half smirking, half grimacing, Miles responded. So you trust me enough to let me take control of your personal computer, just not enough to let me add my own software. Yeah, something like that. Well, it's two in the morning. Why the hell not? Hey everybody, Solve the World is produced by myself, Dante Stack. All the sound effects and music we use for this program are under Creative Commons licenses and can be found on our show notes page at DanteStack.com. I'd like to thank Freesound.org and FreeMusicArchive.org for that material. Hello, I'm Kat from the United Kingdom. I've listened to all 100 episodes of Jen's story. Next time on Solve the World, the Orion must make yet another decision. Make contact with a lone boat that violently doesn't want to be reached, or continue on, ignoring the ominous warning signs. Thankfully for Jennifer, despite whatever troubles she finds herself in, she will now be able to take refuge in the dream world. By the combined efforts of Miles Farr's hypnotic trance and Father Thomas's heartfelt story, come what may, Jen can sleep merrily. Mm -hmm.